everybody here. It's uh, I know it's a little bit warm outside, and you know we're trying to stay cool during this, this intense heat. At least down here, though. Uh, but you know, is when we still gather uh, regardless, and you know we're we're thank God for AC. So, <laughs> but I uh, know it's like uh, being all seriousness. It's it's great to be here and here at God's house and. Um, I know Brother Lee's usually the one that's teaching the, you know, for Sundays, but because of his newborn, he's taking time, uh, you know, apart or, uh, from teaching, and he's asked me to take over on for Sundays temporarily until, you know, he's, uh, he's ready to return. So um, I, did, I don't believe I made that uh, clear last week, so I do apologize. So, but uh, for the next several weeks, I'm going to be, uh, be taking over Brother Lee until... Uh, comes back but so either way it's 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 great to be here and bringing a lesson and you know just diving into God's Word but uh, we're gonna be continuing in on Hosea so we've gone over uh, the first two chapters and now we're gonna be uh, discussing chapter 3 and chapter 3 is only five verses but still um, reg if there's five verses or 50 verses you know there's always something to Get gather into God's word. So, um, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Hosea chapter three. And before I begin, I'd like to say a quick prayer before we we begin. Lord Father, we come to you this morning, thanking you for allowing us to gather in your house. And Lord, we we thank you for for giving us your word and for uh, for allowing us to just to learn more about you and. We ask that you would just allow your spirit to, to dwell in this house, Lord, and that uh, this lesson be uh, a benefit for anybody to hear, Lord. And we thank you for all that you do, and we ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. So, so we've we've gone over the first two chapters, and it, it's been a very uh, it, it's been a very interesting. Uh, story to tell for the very least but um, chapter 3 is uh, regarding um, Hosea's reconciliation with his wife and so if we remember from uh, chapter 2 um, we, we we talked about how Hosea's wife in this case Gomer had um, had lusted other uh, other gods and how God had used that as an example to signify his people of Israel and so now we're seeing in chapter 3 his reconciliation with his wife and so um if you could get somebody to uh to read uh verses one through five uh, hosea chapter three and the lord said to me go again love the woman who is loved by another man and he is an adulteress even as the lord loves the children of israel though they turn to other gods and love caves or races so I bought her for fifteen shekels of silver and a homer and a baton, a barley, and said to her, You must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not pay you should not play her or belong to another man, so I will also be to you, for the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice and pillars without Ethan or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord to his goodness in the later days. Okay, thank you. And we're going to be, we're going to be kind of uh, going verse by verse here. And so uh, we see here that uh, God has commanded Hosea to go and uh, to show love towards his wife. You see the Lord actually saying to him, go show your love to your wife again. Even though, and the second part of verse 1, uh, you know, mentions she is loved by another and is an adulteress. And so we see here that God is telling Hosea to go and love his wife again after what she's done to him. And so what do you make of God's command towards Hosea? Why do you think he's telling him to go and show love for his wife again? I mean, after all, I mean, she is, uh, she did go after other men, and we saw in verse chapter 2 this, and even before, um, before the, the case, the, uh, Gomer was an, 
an adulterous woman. And so why is God now telling him to go show love to, to his wife again after all she's done? I think it's just a representation of uh, God's people to what they did with God. And now God's showing his people love at this point. Uh, same with Hosea showing his wife uh, that same love. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Yeah, and keep in mind too, Hosea is a, he's a prophet. And so this isn't Hosea who is just a commoner. I mean, he's, he's a well-respected prophet of this day. So any respected prophet in the Old Testament would have been uh, reverend and, you know, had been uh, shown like some semblance of respect because of his, his position. And so can you imagine the humiliation and the shame that... Hosea must feel knowing that he's a prophet and his wife is an adulteress and how he has to go back and take her uh, take her back under his care and so uh, you know it it, it, it just shows uh, it's it, in a way it symbolizes God's uh, love for Israel even though they uh, they worship other gods and how they've turned their back on God and then it's you know we've even seen in the last we, you know, how they just stabbed God in the back. And so uh, despite all of this going on, uh, we really see a lot of symbolism between Hosea uh, and God, you know, hit towards their relationship with uh, their wives. And so uh, really the whole book of Hosea is, uh, you know, a living parable, you know, like, you know, we had mentioned before. And so, uh, but notice in the second half of verse one, uh, it shows here, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. And so, you know, that's what we had uh, mentioned. And so, what Steve had mentioned. Though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. How interesting how God had thrown in this uh, this detail. Why do you think God mentioned, what, is, what does this have to do with sacred raisin cakes? Like, and I don't like raisins, to me personally. So, I mean, these must be like sacred raisins or something. <laughs> that must be really good. They used them for the worship, like when they worship their idols. Uh, it was like offerings. Yes, yes. So, um, the, the, so whenever God mentions sacred raisin cakes, these are these were oftentimes used as offerings to Baal. And so, uh, you know, during harvest season, they would, uh, you know, the grape the raisins uh, were, were grapes eventually turned into raisins, and so they um, they relied heavily on. Uh, the harvest being plentiful and good and so they would go to Baal you know uh, asking for prosperity for the land as a result of their uh, um, you know of their their culture you know they relied heavily on agriculture for it to flourish in order for them to, uh, to, to you know to benefit and so they would use this as uh, offerings to Baal but you know of course uh, these were oftentimes used as you know as an offering, in other words, or as something that they would use. And so, uh, in case people aren't really familiar with what that means, that's usually because of, it's associated with, you know, the Baal worshippers. In other words, it's like a sacred thing that they would offer. And so, uh, the, the Israelites loved, um, they loved those raisin cakes. And so, it, it's so much so that God had even mentioned it to them here. And so, we see here, um, you know, we see here an, uh, an emotional um, phase right here with with God and with Israel, with Hosea with his wife and so um, you know knowing the shame and the humiliation it's going to bring him he still uh, God commanded him to go and to show love towards again and so you know of course Hosea being faithful to God he and he he listens and so uh, you see in verse two here uh, you know Hosea listened to God because. Uh, look at verse 2 I, so I brought her for 15 shekels of silver about a homer and a lethal of barley and so we see here that there was a price to be paid because at this point Gomer was um, when you see Hosea uh, offering uh, shekels and silver uh, and uh, leth le uh, lethics of barley and so these were this was like a form of, of payment to, to to buy back Gomer because Gomer was um, after other men and so it got to a point where she was 
uh, she was owned by somebody else. And so, um, so really, we see how Hosea had to actually pay uh, a pay like a fee in order just to get her back. And so this represents a price to be paid, uh, you know, for God's love towards Israel. And so uh, okay. whenever you hear about the the saying, you were bought with a price, you know, uh, that's really what kind of we, that sticks out to me. But, but, yeah, I just think it also shows a lot of humility on his part. Here he has been betrayed by his wife, and, and now he's having to go and pay to get her back, even though he might not have been feeling so <laughs> feeling that way at that time you no. know he, he, but here he is going to go pay a price to get her back it's uh, it's got to be a it'd be a tough one to swallow i think absolutely you know after, he's done nothing wrong to you know to do to deserve this and so not only did she uh become adulterous and so she and she left him and now he's having to go chase after her and now pay just to get her back and so uh it's really it just kind of this is really demonstrates what God does for us in our own lives, you know, because of what our disobedience towards God, God paid what we know, and of course, uh, Jesus paying the ultimate price for our sins, and so, uh, could somebody go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, and then uh, another one goes, same, same Corinthians, but chapter 7, so 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, and then chapter 7, verse 23. So you really you can see a lot of the uh, the similarities here. How um, how we were bought with the price, but of course God paid the ultimate price. You know, for, because He loved us so much, so dearly. And so uh, we see here how uh, Hosea actually had to pay uh, a price just to to get her back. But does anybody have? Um, First Corinthians chapter six. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God with your body. Yeah. And then uh, verse seven. You were bought with a price. Do not become a bond servants of men. So there you have it. So uh, you see, you see a, a a scripture passage alluding to to Hosea chapter three. You know it's. Uh, uh, it, it's really uh, an ultimatum, or you know, it, it's a direct sort of command of you know what Paul says, uh, and so this really signifies a lot of of what's going on here. But uh, any comments or questions? I mean, th it's a beautiful connection between uh, where whenever we we see Paul, you know, speaking about you know our the prices for sin is. You know, was paid by blood, the blood of of Christ, and so now we see how Hosea had to pay a price um, in the same way. But any comments or questions? Any confusion? No, I think for me, the, the thing that stands out is in their culture, right? That they have to pay. I remember Jacob; he he wanted to Rachel, right? And and the dad makes him work for I don't know how many years, and he doesn't give Rachel; he gives the older woman, Leah, I think, and, and consistently. And then I see when Abraham sent, um, you know, his servant to find uh, the wife for Isaac, they spent things. So I think that there was the culture that you have to pay, you know, to the parents. And, and I'm thinking right here in Hosea, hmm. so uh, I know that it's a representation that you're saying that God, is, ultimately Christ paid for ours, you know, our salvation. But I, I, I just, you know, when, when I saw the, the Hosea has to pay, immediately came Jacob in my mind. There's still, there's still cultures today that, yes. that do a dowry, what they call it a dowry, kind of like in Thailand. Thailand, they do a dowry to the, to the parents, which I think is a great idea when you have with daughters yep. that, that men should be paying, paying the parents. <laughs> I've seen a documentary on that. Yeah. Yeah, right. and so we see, uh, that's a great connection because we see how, um, you know, and, and in the case of Jacob, where, um, you know, he, he thought that he could get away, you know, he could, um, he could um, you know, get ahead with, you know, swapping uh, Rachel for Leah. And so, but ultimately, when we try to cheat God, you know, it's not going to, it's going to cost us more in the long run. Even though we may save 
monetary value, we're we're gonna we're gonna lose out big time, you know, in the spiritual sense, you know, when we try to cheat our way to, you know, towards others, especially towards uh, God's uh, called ones, and so uh, that's a great connection because you know we we see uh, examples throughout you know the ancient cultures here uh, how they were they had um, offered a price and sometimes too like it it may not make sense for us too and we can look at it in our own lives too is like how do we know what to you know to how do we know if it's something for God you know whether we should pay something. Uh, whether it's uh, something that God's commanded us to do, or if it's just coming out of our own, our own uh, fleshly uh, desires, you know, we have to discern the difference because uh, I know a lot of times people can confuse. Oh well, God called me to do this, even though they didn't go to prayer or they haven't asked for guidance. They they feel like it was uh, something kind of an emotional thing where they they just rush to a decision. But always remember just to just to sit down and pray and just really um, evaluate um, your decision before really committing because ultimately we need to know if it comes from God first if it comes from God then don't worry about you know how much it costs or you know the the amount because if you do if you pay what God uh, if you're if you're doing what God's called you to do he's going to replenish that for you and so um, I, I think that's a really valuable lesson I've gathered I, I totally agree with everything you just said and it's so true because um our faith is in God, right? It's not in ourselves. It's not in our own ability. It's in the Lord. And we know that the Lord can do whatever he wills if it's his will. And so absolutely, it's a uh, put into prayer and give it to God and then just watch for the signs, you know, um, seek his will for everything. And just like what you were saying, if it's God's will, it's going to come to fruition. It'll come in God's, God's perfect timing. But it, it's going to happen if it's his will. And then everything will be fine because it was ordained by him. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, yeah. And I, I think, too, me personally, I can I can see, like, man, this is, I don't know, God, this is this is a lot. Or, you know, I, I'm not sure if I can fully commit to it. But, you know, I have to just put it in faith and trust in God that he's going to provide. And so uh, I know a lot of times, too, it's just um, it, sometimes our our common sense, I guess you could say, kind of kicks in and he says like, well, you know, this, I'm not going to have enough. I'm going to, I feel like I'm going to uh, be behind now, you know, but, you know, if, if God, God is so good because he, he'll bless whatever we, uh, whatever we decide to do as far as if we follow in his ways, he's going to, he's going to take care of us, you know, and we've seen examples of that throughout scripture, how, you know, People being the good stewards, how they've um, they've learned how to trust in the Lord, and you know just be good stewards of whatever things that God has given them. Otherwise, we're just uh, we're just squandering it off. Like the the younger son, you know, we we don't want to be that, and so we always want to be prudent and wise, innocent as does wise as serpents when it comes to that. But um, any any other comments or questions before I continue? Um, I was gonna say. Tying you back into what uh, Kirk and Maya were talking about price and then, you know, buying, you know. One thing that really stood out to me is that the way that man, that we see each other and we see our value, we see value in others, like we, we measure people like, oh, well, this person's like this good of a person or, you know, um, we put them at different levels in our mind, but God saw value. Um, it was almost like she was able to be put again on the market per se like she has value and it, it just kind of reminds me of how even though we're so broken and we might see each other as broken and there's no value in us God sees value in us and so to be able to be repurchased right there's value there and so I just I see God's love that he sees something in us that we can, because he loves us that much. And also yeah. falls on us too, because we need to be valuable towards God because mm -hmm. God can't use somebody who's useless or worth no value. So uh, that ultimately starts with us um, deciding whether or not we want to continue to 
live in his ways and to follow his instructions. So I, I think too, we need to make ourselves valuable before God can even decide to purchase us, you know. But of course, Israel being his chosen people, he has a purpose for them. You know, it's his, God, it's, it's his chosen people. And so uh, we see how God uses that to purchase back Israel because in his eyes, they're useful and they are gonna be serving as a purpose for later on, you know, whether God reveals his plans, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's going to be unseen for the near future right now. But you know, we have to know that God's ways are higher than our ways, and so, um, but we have to make ourselves valuable before you know we say, well, how come God doesn't bless me? It's like, well, maybe because you're not valuable to Him. Maybe you need to make yourself worth more. <laughs> but yes, amen, and you just kind of said it there at the end when I was thinking, and I'll share with you there. There was a situation one time with a, a young man that I was speaking with that uh, there was a, an event that was coming up that, that he really wanted to participate in. Um, but the thing is, is that he was not, at the moment, living for the Lord. He was not seeking God's will in his life. And when this event occurred, he wasn't part of that event. And he was upset about it. And, you know, he like, shared this with me that, you know, he was he was not happy that he was not asked to, you know, to be part of this thing. And in love, I had to have a conversation with him. It was a difficult conversation with him, but because of things that he had shared with me that he was doing currently in his life at that time, it wasn't that God didn't want to use it. God God wants to use all of us, but it goes back to what are you doing in your life? You know, are you are you making yourself um, in your words, valuable, right? Are you are you allowing the Lord to work in your life, or are you doing things that may be sinful that God that God can't use? You? And that was a really hard conversation that I had to have with this person. But ultimately, he understood that it wasn't that God didn't want to use him. It was because of the things he was doing in his life at that time that God could not use him. So it goes back to what you're speaking. No, yeah, I'm glad you shared that because, you know, um, it's like all of us are made for a purpose, but um, we have to make, we have to pursue our purpose rather than just sitting and doing nothing, expecting God to bless us for that. But, you know, and it goes same thing for us. There's a price to be paid to, you know, to follow Christ. You know, sometimes, you know, we may lose friendships. We may lose uh you know, relationship with others, we may be ostracized, or we may lose, um, you know, our um, our credibility for whatever whatever reason it may be. You know, there's a price to be paid to follow Christ, and you know, I of course that goes. I think of the, uh, you know, the parable or the the young the young man who comes and comes up to Jesus and says, you know, it's like, Lord, what must I do? He's like, go and sell everything, the only young man. and you know, and follow me, but. He didn't. He was such a wealthy man. He 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 went away sad because he did not want to. He did not want to follow that. And of course, people have taken it out of context. It's like, well, God wants me to sell everything. Well, remember, God is talking to this young, this individual right here. He knew he knew that he his heart was not in the right place. He knew that uh, that was the only thing that was preventing him to to follow God and, and Christ. And so um, he was speaking directly towards him. And so. Um, that that's we see examples of that too in in, uh, in New Testaments, but no, but yes, thank you for that, brother. But uh, let's look at verse three here. And so after after Hosea paid his his uh, he had paid to you know to reclaim his wife, we see uh, in verse three, uh, I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will live with you. And so we see him, and I, I, we see Hosea, he's trying. We can't, of course, nobody's ever blamed Hosea at this point, but he's trying to restore a covenant bond with his wife. He's, he's trying to tell him, can you please just, like, not do this anymore? Like, I'm just, I'm, and how often does God do that to us? It's like, can you please stop? doing you know your sin and stop turning your back on me like we've had a covenant promise you know you and i have agreed to this 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 bond this promise but now you're over here you're just you're breaking your part you're 
you're not fulfilling your end of the bargain and so uh, we see here Kosea trying to you know to bargain or you know not bargain but uh, restore his his relationship with his wife and so uh, I can only imagine this is a very tough conversation the ESV is a little bit more descriptive I think when he says you shall not play the whore or being or, or belong to another man and I can only imagine him saying that to his wife and you can imagine also the pain in his eyes or the pain know, his, in his eyes his but I, it you know just saying that to, to a woman I, I mean that's just uh, I'm sure he's hurting yes. and I'm sure uh, I just wonder how she's feeling at this point as well but well, I mean, ultimately, we this is this is how God speaks to us. Oftentimes, you know, when we just being when we just go after other gods, you know, God loves us so much that He He's willing to sacrifice His own Son just to, Amen. you know, John three sixteen. He's not He for loved the world that He uh, He gave His one and only Son, and so we see His love towards us, and so and all God asks for us in return is just for Him to love us back. That's all he asks for us, just to follow him and just trust in him and just love him. And that's all he really asks for us. And somehow, some way, we end up just messing that up all the time. And so, but you, like you said, brother, I think you can, you can tell this, the conversation. It's like, you know, how he must hurt him. It's, uh, you know, it's tough for him to say this to her. But, I mean, of course, uh, all he can do is just share in his heart how he feels and you know what he what he asks of her and ultimately it's up to her whether she decides to listen or to just ignore that um, that saying. But any yeah. comments or questions? So Even through all that uh, of what she's done, you know, at the end of it, at the end of verse three, he says, "And so I will also be to you," you know, saying, "He must dwell as mine for many days," and he's he's recommitting to that. <clears throat> that you know that covenant between the two of them, yeah, uh, and God, and so you know that's a that's a tough thing for him to swallow. I'm sure at the same exact time. Yeah, and he he kept his he kept his promise, of course. Um, but of course, whenever he's talking with her, it's like a reminder. like uh, this is my this is what I'm doing for you. Unless you've somehow forgotten or maybe ignored that part, I'm just going to remind you again. This is what I've this is my promise to you. As long as you were to dwell with me. And so, uh, you see him um, speaking to Gomer in this way. And uh, in verse 4, we see uh, right here after she's, after speaking with, uh, with Gomer, we see here in verse 4, For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or idol. Do you remember whenever Israel had demanded a king and how... Uh, God had, you know, they were set apart, and so, but even though regardless, they wanted a king, and so, um, ultimately, God, he'd allowed, you know, through Samuel to have them anoint Saul as king, and so there was a purpose, and so he's alluding back to this example, because, um, you know, even before King David, there was King Saul, but before that, there was, the Israelites never had a king, you know, God was their king. And so, but of course, Israel wanted to, they wanted to follow like the other nations. They wanted to, you know, they wanted to, to be like them. It's almost like, you know, you have a, you have somebody special set apart because they're different or they're special, but they see other, the other people doing other things and they want to sim associate with that. But God, ultimately, he's, he has them isolated for a reason because, uh, his plans for Israel is to be set apart. He does not want them to be like that. And so we see here, uh, when he mentions king or prince, you know, uh, he's alluding to that time before, you know, the, the, the king, uh, you know, they've, they've had King Saul. And then, of course, in the second part says, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or idols. And so we see here that God's reflecting here on Israel, you know, and so it's, it's almost like we're seeing... Uh, how God's relationship with them is, is you know, where, where this this will be no longer. And so um, we see examples here uh, 
even before, at one point, Israel was. They were, it's not like Israel had always disobeyed. They had obeyed God for a short time, but then they would fall and they would have to, they would off, they would want to come back to God and, you know, God would restore that. So it's a, it's a cycle of how Israel's, you know, it's their, their obedience to God ultimately falls short and how they, um, they disobey God and how God has to restore them. And so uh, we, we see a, pa a continuous pattern going on here. And look at verse 5 here. It says, Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. And so we see how God is showing we sh they're showing Israel's, you know, their return to him. And so you can imagine how God must feel uh, finally seeing a response towards the Israelites, um, finally deciding to seek uh, God in this way. But what do you notice in, in these uh, two verses? Does anything stick out to you when, whenever God's saying this? Yeah, because, I mean, what, what sticks out to verse 5 is that this isn't something like Israel will do and then eventually they'll break that promise. I think this is almost like like a future envision of their repentance to God. And so you see here, it's like in the end, you know, like uh, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord. So up to this point, you know, we've seen Israel fall short. They failed God. They disobeyed. And so like... Now that they're, you know, we, we see Israel right now, you know, they're in a state of like of confusion. They don't know where they're going, but, you know, because God loves Israelites so much, they've, since, since they first began as a people, God's always set them apart and God never forgot about them here. And so you see here in verse five, it's, it's like, uh, you, you almost see like they're like the end story of how the Israelites will turn out to be, you know, they will they will seek the Lord their God and David their king and they will be trembling. You see right here that word, they will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. So I, I it, to me, I see this as almost like uh, like the end story of this great story of the, the history of the Israelites. And so, you, you know, it's, we always, we always, and I've always, we've in other Bible studies we've mentioned how you know we see the Gentiles and the Israelites almost like the relationship between the two brothers, the elder son and the, the younger. So we and we always pray. We've always prayed for the Israelites. Of course, um, we see them as you know as a brother of Christ. You know, or you know, we we hope to see them one day as that. And so we see this example here how they finally come trembling uh, and, and repenting in a way. You know, but. It just seems like there's almost two different stories happening here in in chapter three. I mean, the first three are are totally about Gomer, him and himself, Hosea and Gomer. But then four and five just kind of looks like they kind of change and is talking about the children of Israel and and how they'll return to God. And it, it almost seems like they're two different chapters talking about two different things but I guess I, I don't know how those two tie in together because yeah because um, the whenever we see the story when we see Jose and Gomer it's a it's a living like it's a living parable of the relationship between the Israelites okay. and God and so uh, we I see that, that um, we're, we're seeing a side-by-side -side comparison so whenever you're seeing God talking about uh, the Israelites and how um, earlier it talks about Gomer and Hosea uh, we have to we have to see it as a, a the re same relationship God has with the Israelites. How the Israelites have um, you know have poured other other idols, 
and God, you know, is Hosea and this the story and how the Israelites we uh, the Israel or the Israelites in the Pacific are like Omer, and so we exactly. see the the, the, the similar things there. Amen. Yeah, and I think that the uh, questions that we would apply to one should apply to the other. Like, what, what's one of the most common questions that we see? Why would God uh, instruct Hosea to marry such a woman? Good question. Why would God uh, marry such an unfaithful people such as Israel? Huh. It's so, it's so like, if the Israelite came up, why did God do that? Exactly. Why would God work with you? Why would God have a covenant with you too? That you're so unfaithful. And then, you know, why would God, uh, why would you bring her back? Why would you go looking for her? She deserves to go. Exactly. Why would God bring you back? Why would God, you know, so it's the questions apply to both. And and it should, um, it should, and I think that the, the purpose was to convict Israel to see themselves in that living parable. I like the way you use the I word living parable. Uh, because it, it convicts them. They see that, they go, that's us. And uh, so it's 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 a humbly moment, and you're right. Uh, when you look at verse five, not only is there a um, what you see here, God is 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 speaking long term as well. So there's a sal salvific plan. He's like, you know, I'm I'm working with you now, but I'm also working with you in the long run. It's like a parent disciplining a child. Like this may be unpleasant now, but in the long run, this is going to teach you this. This is going to develop you into this character. And so God is here speaking, like he says here in the last days, he's saying this right here is necessary so that in the, in the last days, Israel will come to finally uh, surrender to me and will come to be obedient to me. So, so you see the, both the, uh, an immediate and a long, a large picture. Yeah, and uh, it, 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 when we see the, I, this, this whole book of Hosea, it's, it's almost like it's resorted to extreme measures for them to finally understand what he's trying to tell him and so uh, and that's the individual story how many of us here can can say oh yeah god used extreme measures with me and it was those events those experiences that brought us back to him if we're honest with ourselves yeah sometimes that it, it, it takes to that goes to go to the extreme just for us to finally understand what i kept hearing in the study was one word constantly fidelity fidel faithful Fidelity. Fidelity between a man and a woman, but moreover, fidelity in your relationship with God. Here's something that I learned early on in my life, Michael, because I can be a jealous woman. But the thing is, my husband has a relationship and a love of the Lord. And because he loves the Lord far more than he loves me and is faithful to the Lord, I will never have to worry about my husband being unfaithful to me because it would first dishonor God, and that would break Val's heart. So the Christian woman who has truly a faithful husband in the Lord can take a lot off of her shoulders because if he's seeking after God's heart, a lot of times your heart is going to be saved from the things that people who don't know the Lord. It's a peace of mind knowing Absolutely. that you know your it's covenant freedom, promises with God a liberty, first and foremost. Exactly, and that's why when young women are seeking when young men are seeking, that's why the Lord says, be evenly yoked, mm -hmm. because you will avoid all of that. And I, unfortunately, Isaiah was not evenly yoked. He got, you know, but he had big, he was trusted with a much bigger purpose. I still struggle with that. I feel like that's hard, but he was up for the task, and it benefited all of us. So for that, I'm thankful. But it, it's, it's hard to understand that you, like you were saying, it's tough now, but you're going to be so much better off because of this. Sometimes we have to go through those hardships to finally uh, come out ahead in the long run. And so, uh, you know, it, it may be temporarily painful at first, but, you know, it's ultimately for our own good. You know, if we if we commit to this plan and trust in him, I think, you know, it'll be to our benefit and his benefit, too. We, we both we both see uh, both God and us will, you know, we, we see... We both gain a lot out of you know as long as we were to keep our covenant with him and so but amen for that i didn't understand the one through three and the four through five how they come come together but when it's all explained like that what a what a beautiful story it is brother yeah uh, i mean i mean it, it's harsh at the beginning just like our relationship and you know god had to humble himself 
I guess it's like humbling himself to take these people who are so unfaithful and dirty, but yet I love them, and I'm going to bring them in the same as, you know, Hosea did with, with Gomer. I mean, it, would have, it is a beautiful story. And what is his name, you know, to make them not seek anybody else. Kind of like, baby, you gonna love me, and you're not gonna have and have that, but he gives that free will. You know, that I want you to choose me. I don't want to impose. And I think kind of like, go back to the parenting skills, you know, we, we tell the kids, do this, and we really want them to, to do it because they see, you know, just the consequences, you know, kind of so to speak. And I think I, I see here God, you know, um, having that power to, to do whatever he wants with his people. And he's still giving that freedom. I want you to choose me. I don't want you to post. Yeah, it's our own choice whether we want to follow the Lord or not. And so, um, of course, God all wants us to follow him. But, of course, he, he, ins he allows us to make our own decisions. And, you know, ultimately, if we decide to, you know, to disobey God or follow in his ways, you know, the... We'll either see the rewards or the consequences of our decision. Yeah, yeah. Uh, brother, I love um, how Hosea chapter three is just is timeless. There's no expiration to it. It talks to the, the individual, it talks to the church, and it talks to the world. Um, all I see in these first, in these five verses is literally the the entire New Testament and how Christ came on earth paid for and redeemed us and even uh, throughout the um, the last days of verse 5 and it's just amazing how God's word is just like yeah. there's no expiration to it, it's, it's timeless it's I think the whole book is timeless brother I mean we can even go back to the Old Testament and see how it's still relevant today as you know if we were to go to the last book in Revelations and so yeah. and God's word is timeless and you know for those who say it's an it's a book written by man. Who, you know, it's it's ancient. It's irrelevant. That's it, it's not true. It's it's far from it. You know, it's it's our guide to life. It's you know, it's our it's what we we depend on daily, and we should always be committed to, to learning more about God's word. Even even if we're not here gathered as a as a as a church family, apart from you know, apart from this church or this building, we need to always be uh, studying God's word. But again, thank you for all the comments and the, the questions and uh, we're going to be continuing in Hosea here in the next few weeks but stay tuned it's uh there's uh, plenty more chapters to dive into but let's go to the Lord Lord Father we come to you this morning allowing us to say thank you for allowing for all of the uh, for, for allowing us just to learn more about you Lord I thank you for all who have gathered here to learn and to, to to know about your word Lord because your word is timeless Lord it never ceases it never expires it always is as relevant as it is before it is now uh, we thank you for all that you do thank you for your spirit and for your your sacrifice for us Lord your your the blood on the cross was for for us Lord that we shall never forget that uh, we thank you for all that you do in your son's name we ask amen, amen. amen.